Greetings, friends and brethren. What I thought I would do for this week was uh, something I've done similar in the past, and that is I've titled this particular sermon Questions and Continuing Church of God Answers. And what this is, is I'm going to address a variety of subjects tonight as opposed to today, as opposed to just one uh, brief uh, one extensive subject. And what I've done is I've taken a book of letters that the, the old Worldwide Church of God used to pass out, and I'm doing these in order. The last time I did uh, up until uh, letter 20, and I did them in the order of the way that they appeared around the time of the death of the late Herbert Umber Armstrong. So these were not selectively picked by me. I'm just going to just do basically random questions and provide answers to the different subjects. Well, the first one, this is letter in the old series of 21, the question was, how do you become an ordained minister in the Church of God? And the response basically starts with John uh, uh, 15, verse 16. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So this tells us from the beginning that Jesus or, uh, picks those uh, who wants to be in the ministry. And this is similar to what it tells us in Colossians 1.18, that the Church of God is governed by uh, God through His Son, Jesus Christ, who's the head of the Church. Now, being ordained to an office means being put into a position of service and good works. Uh, this is not a, a glamour thing. Uh, the Apostle uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.1, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop or pastor, he desires a good work. Paul then outlines some of the basic requirements. So why don't we go there? So if you take your Bibles, we're going to go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And I'll repeat again this. 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop, then, must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. And there's some warnings in the book of Ezekiel about uh, shepherds who are in it for the money, and you're not supposed to be that way. But gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Verse 5, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Verse 6, Not a novice, lest, he, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. And the devil was condemned for his pride. Verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So basically, what this is saying is a person should know how to handle his family well, uh, live within society reasonably well. That doesn't mean the person is compromising with society, but generally speaking, an uh, honest, hardworking individual. And another position, might as well go into this one also, in verse 8, likewise deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine. So there's a warning here that the people who tend to drink too much should not be deacons or uh, in this type of service. Not greedy for money. That money power, uh, point comes up again. Holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. They should actually believe the, what the Bible teaches. But let those also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Verse 11, likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. So if a person is supposed to be ordained to an office, his uh, wife, presumably he has one, is supposed to be reverent, not a slanderer, to, uh, be faithful. Verse 12, let deacons be the husbands of one wife, similar to bishops or pastors, ruling their children in their own house as well. Verse 13, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we see some of the criteria uh, that are there. 
Now, James 1, excuse me, James 3, verse 1, I'm going to read this. This is from the uh, Old King James. It says, Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that you shall receive a stricter judgment. So there's a, a comment here that even though Paul said it's a good thing to want to do this, understand that uh, in the Church of God, everybody does not have to become a formal teacher or formally ordained in order to, to do something. And of course, you can be one who serves without being ordained. Uh, if you go to uh, James 1.27, James said, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So that's pure religion, and that's what you should be doing, whether or not you have an ordained position or not. If you're in the Church of God, you've been baptized in the Church of God, you're expected to serve. You're expected to love one another and to serve where you can serve. Not butt in where you shouldn't be, of course, but serve where you can. All right, grab this. Apparently the new area of service I need is to figure out how I'm going to uh, keep, keep my notes up when I've got multiple different types of notes. So this is sort of a different format that way. Also, if you go to the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 35, uh, Jesus said of those who are to inherit the kingdom of God, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. Matthew 25, verses 35 and 6. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. So there's a lot of ways to serve. So if you believe that God has called you to serve, serve. And if circumstances, a situation arises where uh, it may become time for you to become ordained as a deacon or a deaconess, if you're a woman, uh, or a, a bishop or pastor uh, or elder, uh, You've seen the criteria, but in the Church of God, historically, uh, people don't just volunteer and get that job. Although sometimes throughout the history of the church, that's happened. Sometimes there's areas where there haven't been people, and so that's kind of how they've done it. But uh, through proper church governance, generally speaking, uh, it's made obvious to God, hopefully by your actions and your works, and God will have someone anointed and ordained uh, in a particular office. Okay, now this goes to letter 22. Question about the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin, in case you were not familiar with this, is a garment that some believe was on Jesus' body that uh, after he was uh, crucified and he was wrapped in it, they believed that when he was resurrected, some type of special energy or power went into it and it made this particular garment unusual or different. So this particular a uh, garment is in uh, Torino, also otherwise known as Turin, in Italy. Uh, they display it publicly, I think, once every year or two. Um, I've never actually publicly seen it. I've seen some pictures on the internet, and I think I saw a couple of documentaries that, that mentioned it, but personally I have not seen it. Uh, the uh, various ones who've done analysis of this, including certain Catholic sources, uh, have suggested it's not legitimate. For example, the Los Angeles Times on October 14, 1988, quoted Cardinal Bestalero as saying, quote, The calibrated calendar age range assigned to the shroud cloth with a 95% confidence level is from 1260 to 380 A.D. Well, since Jesus was crucified around 31 A.D., uh, the age is, it just simply does not work. Others have questioned the aging process and said, no, it, it really is older. This, this particular document is, or garment is different than other types of fabric. It's got some unique characteristics that people have not been able to explain. Therefore, it must be real. Well, the other problem with that is that when Jesus' body was wound, it was in linen cloths, as it says in the book of John, chapter 19, verse 40. And that would not look like the Shroud of Turin, which is this one big, long uh, garment, which is like a, a burial sheet. It just, it just doesn't fit. Even if it was 
a cloth that was on Jesus. That doesn't make it, you shouldn't worship it, shouldn't pray before it, uh, and that, that type of thing. But as far as I've been able to determine, and I've done some research along this line, that this simply doesn't appear to be legitimate. And again, even if it is, uh, it's just a physical object. Uh, we don't worship those, uh, we don't uh, adore them, and those, those kinds of things. But again, most of the evidence seems to suggest that this is not actually legitimate anyway. It doesn't fit with the scripture, and it doesn't seem to fit with most of the analysis that have been done on the aging of the particular garment. The next one, this one used to be of more personal interest to me. Thank you for your question concerning hunting and killing animals. I grew up in an area where most males spent a lot of time hunting, and uh, when I was uh, younger, I used to hunt a fair amount. I was that good at it, <laughs> but I did. I used to hunt, and uh, one thing I was kind of curious about when I came to the church. Of course, I knew that in the Bible that various ones were hunters, and I knew that that was not uh, condemned. And so here's the basic response to this question: Is is it appropriate to hunt or to kill animals? Well, in the beginning, God gave humankind dominion over everything. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. We can see that. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Then God blessed them. This is after he made humans male and female. And said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. So he expected them to have children. Fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God gave them dominion. And let's go to the book of Luke. Let's go to the New Testament. Luke chapter 5. And read something about some of the people that Jesus called. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gisenaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Verse 3. Then he, that's Jesus, got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little bit from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes of the boat. Verse 4. When he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, this is Simon uh, Peter, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. So Jesus told Simon to go fishing. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we toiled all night. We caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. There's no fish here, Jesus. We know. We've, we're fishermen. We've been fishing all, all night. There really isn't anything here. And verse 6. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. Verse 7, So they sent with their partners the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boats so that they began to sink. Verse 8, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. So Simon Peter realized uh, that Jesus had just performed a miracle. Peter was thinking he's not worthy to be around Jesus for all of this. Verse 9, For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish which they had taken. So they, they were catching lots of fish. So they were, they were fishermen. And they were killing animals. Verse 10, So also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they were partners with Simon. So Jesus called a bunch of fishermen. But then he changed their job. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. Verse 11, so when they brought their boats to land, they forsook, they forsook all and followed him. So we see here an incident that Jesus specifically went and called fishermen. And just to be sure that it wasn't that he called them fishermen and then had them repent from fishing, Jesus said, no, go fish. Throw the nets out. Catch the fish. In the Old Testament, a man after God's own heart, David, said that he, in uh, 1 Samuel 17, verses 34 through 36, and I'm not going to turn there right now, he said that he killed a, a lion and a bear because they were bothering his sheep. He was a shepherd, and he went out and he killed them. And he was a man after God's own heart. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you should just kill animals, just let them die. 
I've been to uh, Alaska a couple of times around the Feast of Tabernacles, and actually in Alaska they have an ordinance that you cannot kill a meat animal and let the meat go to waste. And the meat animals were things like uh, a deer and moose and that type of a thing. Uh, bear, which are unclean, uh, was, wasn't listed. I, suppose, I guess people sometimes use those for rugs or whatever. But uh, this is consistent with the Bible. You're supposed to have dominion over the world. To be a good steward, you don't just kill for no reason. Of course, if bugs are bothering you, you kill them, you don't eat them. But you know, throughout the Bible, uh, it tells us that we can eat meat. Uh, you can read about that in various scriptures. But the general answer to the question is, is it okay to kill animals? The answer is yes. Uh, Jesus had fish killed, uh, David killed animals, others in the Bible. Uh, Isaac had his uh, son go out and kill him, uh, the type of meat that he wanted to eat and he wasn't condemned for that as well. So a lot of people uh, eventually called by God, one way or the other were involved in hunting, killing animals and, uh, and, and meat, including uh, Abel. That was letter number uh, 23. Uh, letter 24, by the way, was people wanted to know what the Greek and uh, Roman alphabet and the uh, Hebrew alphabet looks like. This is not gonna show up well, but I thought I would just show this, just in general. It probably doesn't come out very clear. The letters that we currently use, by the way, are basically the Latin or the Roman letters. That's what uh, most cultures use in modern, modern days. Of course, some of the Asian cultures, they don't, don't do that. And of course, in uh, Greece, by the way, they still use the Greek characters. And the Hebrews do use uh, Hebrew, but the Roman characters are what we use now. Now, the next question has to do with Mark chapter 9, verse 48. So letter 26 in this particular series. We'll go to uh, Mark 9, 48, because that was the question. Now, well, I'm going to start in verse 47. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into Gehenna fire where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Now we're going to deal with one of these other questions a little bit uh, later. But, so the question is, some people believe that Jesus is referring to sinners as worms and that Jesus said that people would never die but would live on in agonizing torment, which is consistent with a book called The, the uh, Divine Comedy by uh, an author in the Middle Ages known as uh, Dante. But that's actually what, what the Bible teaches. It's actually kind of interesting. Uh, pagan cultures had this idea of uh, eternal tormenting. Uh, Dante kind of wrote it up in his uh, book. And some of that had already been in the Greco-Roman faith, but it didn't, they didn't get it from the Bible. But some like to point to this particular scripture as proof. They believe that this means that People are going to be uh, being tortured forever and all that kind of stuff. But Jesus didn't call the wicked people worms, but he spoke of their worm. The original Greek worm, word means grubber maggot. Jesus re was referring to a local method of garbage disposal in order to emphasize the permanent consequences of sin not repented of. The margin of some Bibles shows the words in verse 47 should be translated as Gehenna fire. And that's how I translated it because that's actually what... The, what the Greek suggests. Gehenna was also known as the Valley of Hinnom. It's located outside the city of Jerusalem. Trash, refuse, animal car carcasses, and even dead bodies of despised criminals were thrown in there to be destroyed by the fires which were kept burning on the valley floor. If uh, some animal or vegetable matter got caught on the ledges on the way down, uh, on the rim, it would be devoured by maggots as opposed to burning. So Jesus' point was that whatever was thrown into the valley was never going to come out again. It was going to be totally consumed. In other words, just as nothing and no one exterminated the maggots or extinguished the fires in the valley of Gehenna, so there would be no escape to certain fate that God has decreed for all unrepentant sinners uh, death in the lake of fire. So we can go, let's go to the uh, book of uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20. Here. Uh, 
uh, verse 15. Uh, it says, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, some of these same principles apply to Isaiah 66, verse 24. So we can go there as well. So let's go to Isaiah 66. Verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm does not die, and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. The meaning is not that unrepentant sinners or worms live forever. In fact, just the opposite is true. If worms which infest a dead body aren't killed, the rotting flesh will consume, be consumed until it's gone. The maggots go through a process known as pupation and turn into flies, kind of a metamorphosis process. These flies in turn deposit additional eggs in the process repeated until nothing is left for them to feed on. Similarly, any fire which is not quenched, not deliberately put out, will last only as long as there is fuel to keep it burning and then go out. The whole point is that, is that sin not repented of has absolute and permanent results. Eternal oblivion. And again, I'm doing this in the order of the letters, so sometimes the stuff is really going to bounce around here because I'm actually going to get back to part of this one probably um, before I get done tonight. Letter 27. People want to know about mediums. Uh various so-called prophets, hypnotists, witches, fortune tellers, clairvoyants, crystal gazers, supposed miracle workers, and the like. Uh, some people sometimes ask questions about specific individuals such as Nostradamus, who uh, claim to foretell the future. Nostradamus, by the way, was into things like astrology and used uh, techniques similar to what astrologers and other fortune tellers did at this time. Now, you can know whether or not uh, Someone's a servant of God related to prophets by some of the criteria. I'm not going to go through a lot of them tonight. We actually have a sermon uh, called How to Determine if Someone's a True Prophet of God. Also, if you go to the www.cogwriter.com website, there's also an article on that. But right now, let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 13. And read, read there. Deuteronomy chapter 13. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder comes to pass, which he spoke to you, saying, Let's go after other gods which you've not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. So what this is saying is, just because somebody could give a prophecy or prediction that's true, doesn't mean they're from God. Now, the Greco-Roman faith seemed to act differently than that. They tend to believe that if one of their uh, demon-influenced prophets has says something and it comes to pass, this is proves that they're from God. But frequently these people are telling us to uh, turn to Mary, the mother of Jesus, for salvation or for some other thing, or teaching us other things that are not in the Bible. They're telling us to go after other gods. Anyway, it says that if this happens, the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. So if somebody comes and says something, it happens, but they tell you to worship contrary to the Bible. God is testing you. So just because something happens doesn't mean you need to follow it. The Bible clearly warns that there are going to be signs and lying wonders that those who do not have the love of the truth are going to be deceived by. That's discussed in 2 Thessalonians uh, ch uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 9 through 12. And those who don't have the love of the truth are going to be deceived. So you've got to pay attention, not just whether somebody makes a prediction that happens, but whether or not this person is telling you to obey the God of the Bible. Verse 4, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments, obey His voice and serve Him and hold fast to Him. So there, there was a warning there. There's another warning, and I'm not going to go there, which basically also says, by the way, if a, if a prophet rises up and tells you something that doesn't come to pass, you don't have to fear him. Uh, there was a self-appointed apostle who had a variety of predictions for August of 2013, by the way, that did not come to pass. 
I denounced him as false before it happened. I denounced him as false after it happened. But this is referring, this, the question here was, you know, people sometimes look at their horoscope and sometimes your horoscope gets it right. Uh, or something they may have heard of uh, maybe Nostradamus' uh, interpretation. A lot of things with Nostradamus, by the way, people interpret them after the fact and kind of make it all fit. But, but that being said, go to uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Now I'm going to read this from the old King James, 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And that's how you're supposed to try the spirits. Verse, uh, let's go to the book of uh, Isaiah. We're going to read another similar criteria. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. Okay, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums, it's a specific question about mediums, and wizards, which are essentially male witches, who whisper and mutter, and sometimes they make all kinds of odd sounds, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? You're not supposed to do that. Verse 20, to the law and the, to the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. So you're only supposed to listen to people who, who are prophets, who tell you to do what the Bible teaches. As it says in Matthew 4.4, 4, uh, uh, man shall not live by, every, uh, by, by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, we're not supposed to be ignorant of Satan's devices and plans. As many of you know, I've read a lot of prophecies of various ones who are definitely not called by God. I believe that, as, it's, as the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, we're not supposed to be ignorant of Satan's devices. And one of these devices throughout history has been that Satan and or his demons have influenced prophets in the Greco-Roman faith to write down a lot of things that are going to deceive people. For example, there's a prophecy in the Bible warning about the king of the north and he's going to invade the king of the south. Well, the Catholics have a prophecy that says the great prince of the north is going to go down and eliminate the countries that are basically, or the peoples that are basically now the ones that the Bible refers to as the king of the south. Basically, it's the same kind of thing. The problem is the Bible says this king of the north person is not a good person, yet Catholic prophecy suggests that he is a good person. And there are many, many, many Catholic prophecies that will deceive people at the time of the end. There are Catholic prophecies, by the way, that tell people to fight against Jesus when he returns. So how could that be? Well, for example, there's a Catholic prophecy that says that the Antichrist wins the so-called Battle of Armageddon. Now, we know that the battle doesn't actually happen in Armageddon, but the troops are staged there. And then uh, they go toward Jerusalem, and they're destroyed. Well, the Bible says Jesus wins that particular battle, but at least one Catholic prophet who, prophetess, who's now a saint, I believe now, said that Antichrist wins that battle. So when Jesus wins, there are private prophecies they are going to tell people to fight against him. Catholic prophecy warns that the Antichrist is going to be Jewish. Well, Jesus was a Jew. Catholic private prophecy warns that the Antichrist will keep the Sabbath. Well, Jesus kept the Sabbath. God's people have always kept the Sabbath. The faithful ones have tried to keep the Sabbath. Kept the Sabbath. They say he's going to have a lot of uh, Jewish habits. Jesus had those as well. That he will uh, resurrect the dead. Jesus is going to do that. Reward his followers. Jesus is going to do that when he returns. And punish the rest. Jesus is going to do that as well. All those type of things Jesus is going to do. Yet there are private prophets who've been influenced by demons who are going to persuade people not to listen to Jesus. Paul warns at the time of the end people are going to fall for the doctrine of demons. You can read, that about, read about that in 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. And a lot of doctrines of demons have been spewed forth through these various mediums, private prophets, 
that Satan has influenced throughout the centuries. I've gone through this. There are satanically influenced prophecies that I've found from at least the 200 ADs to present, and I think there are some in the 100s, and there's most likely some even prior to that, in bits and pieces that are out there. And it's important that you know that, because what's going to happen is some of these signs and wonders are going to come to pass. Rank and file people are going to be deceived. Jesus said that if it were possible, even the very elect could be deceived. And you need to stay close to God. You need to believe what your Bible says. You need to read your Bible, study your Bible, pray, check out what I'm saying. Make sure what I'm saying is correct. Make sure I'm not trying to mislead you. Which, despite my flaws, dropping books and everything else I might do, I'm certainly not trying to mislead you. And hopefully I'm teaching you uh, what the Bible teaches on a variety of uh, subjects. Okay, the next one has to do with uh, Elijah. So, someone wants to know if the prophet Elijah is supposed to come before Jesus returns. So, if you take your Bibles, go to the book of Malachi. We're going to go to Malachi chapter 4. And we'll read the passage here. And I'll go over some other things related to this in just a moment. Malachi chapter 4. I'd like to start this in verse 4. The question started in verse 5, but I'd still like to start in verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, when I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. And we do want to remember the laws that God uh, gave through Moses. And that's something that we teach in the Continuing Church of God. Verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet... When? Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So this is prior to Jesus' return, prior to the time the trumpet's being blown. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Well, actually this means utter destruction. Remember I was mentioning a few moments ago, Jesus said, unless those days be shortened, well, actually, like Jesus talking about people being deceived. Jesus said, Lest those days be shortened, this is Matthew 24, no flesh should be saved alive, but for the elect's sake, they would be shortened. So if God did not send Elijah to come, uh, it says he could have destroyed the entire earth, but he's not going to do that. He's going to send Elijah to come. Now, if you go to Luke chapter 1, verse 17, there was an Elijah. We're going to read that, Luke chapter 1. And before we go down to uh, uh, verse uh, 17, we're going to go in verse 13. An angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will call his name John. So this is a prophecy regarding John the Baptist. Now we'll skip down through all this. Verse 16, he'll turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. So he's helping turn the hearts of the father, uh, oh, the children of their father. And we know that uh, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him would not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make a people prepared for the Lord. So we see that this was uh, a prophecy that John the Baptist was going to partially fill. Now they asked him, they asked John in first, in, excuse me, John chapter one, verse nineteen twenty-three, if he was Elijah, and he said no. But Jesus in Matthew eleven, verse uh, seven through fifteen, said that that he was uh, the Eli and Elijah to come. Again, he was in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He was not Elijah resurrected. Again, I actually got an email from somebody uh, uh, this week trying to tell you, trying to tell me that it's actually Elijah being resurrected again or something. And, uh, it's not going to be. 
Now, the subject of Elijah has come up a few times, and I want to go through a variety of Elijah heresies right now. I'm going to mention five Elijah heresies, and I'm going to briefly discuss them. Heresy one, there is no Elijah after John the Baptist since he fulfilled that role. Now, there are people who hold that. I'd rather, for this, I'm not going to say which particular churches that are in Church of God that, uh, that claim that. But the reality is that that's not what the, the, what the Bible teaches. The Bible does teach that there will be an Elijah to come. And how do you know this? Uh, if you'll go to the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 11. We're going to talk about this for just a second. Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. This is important. Jesus said Elijah is going to come and he's going to restore all things. Now, this word will restore is a Greek term. And I haven't been studying my Greek lately. Apokatha systemi, which means to reconstitute or to restore again. It's preceded by the Greek term men, which means truly in the assertive sense. It doesn't mean men in the people sense. And these men understood that Matthew 17, 11 could not be referring to John the Baptist. How do you know that it could not be referring to John the Baptist? Because Jesus said he's coming. He said, yeah, but Jesus said John the Baptist was Elijah. Well, John the Baptist was beheaded in Matthew 14, verse 10. Since John the Baptist was beheaded in Matthew uh, 14, 10, and Jesus said Elijah is going to come and restore things, he's talking about someone who comes after words. There's a parallel account in Mark chapter 9 verses 12 and 13. And I'll go through that. It says, And he, that's Jesus, answered them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. So all things still have to be restored. How is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah also came, they did to him whatever they wished as it was written of him. Now the Greek term translated in Mark 9.13 as also is K-A-I, Kai, which means and, also, even so, then, etc. Therefore Jesus was saying Elijah will come to restore all things and that John Baptist was also a type of Elijah but he was not recognized. Now I'm going to say that my knowledge of Greek is not perfect. But the early church writers who did understand Greek way better than I uh, did teach that Elijah was going to come uh, again. Even somebody who met uh, Polycarp, who was a faithful Church of God leader, uh, felt the same way. Now, we'll also read something else in the book of Malachi. Go to Malachi chapter 3 and go to verse 1. Malachi 3. Verse 1 says, Behold, I'll send my messenger, and he'll prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 2, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and like a launder's soap. Now the Bible, for example, in Acts 1.11, says Jesus is going to come again. And the, and the Bible also shows that people did and were able to endure Jesus' first coming. He was killed by them. He was not like a refiner's fire. And so the, the Bible associates the, the time of refining is going to come with the time of punishment later. For example, uh, you can read about that in Daniel 11, Jeremiah 7, 7 through 9, uh, uh, Revelation 3, talking about Laodicea, talks about that as well. So the reality is the Bible does teach Elijah is going to come. Now there's a second heresy that I'd like to address here. At least one or two Church of God groups, or at least they call themselves Church of God, they claim that if you don't believe that Herbert W. Armstrong was a prophesied Elijah, you cannot be baptized, you cannot even attend church services. Now, I've read this book from beginning to the end multiple times. 
I've read writings on church history. I've read at least the ones that are translated into English, pretty much everything I've been able to get my hands on from first and second century. Never was it hinted that this Elijah matter was so important that you had to know for sure who this was going to be for any particular reason such as going to church, uh, other than accepting what the Bible itself teaches. So I believe that is an absolutely unbiblical requirement, and that is a heresy, and some groups out there believe that. Now there's another heresy, which is uh, probably even more widespread. Those who believe that Herbert Armstrong was not Elijah, or think he did, oh, okay, the heresy is that if you don't believe Herbert Armstrong was an Elijah, uh, you can't be trusted to not change what Herbert Armstrong did. Well, I've got articles at the www.cogwriter.com website on a couple dozen churches of God, including group, various groups who say they stood for precision of uh, doctrine, they're going to teach exactly what late Herbert Armstrong taught, etc., etc. They all have deviated whether or not they teach Herbert Armstrong was Elijah. Now, Herbert Armstrong himself, by the way, would have deviated too. He changed his position on a variety of matters. But so to say that somebody, uh, if, if you don't think that Herbert Armstrong was the Elijah, that means you're going to change things. Uh, the reality is that that was simply not the case. The other thing I'd like to mention this with this uh, heresy, as I mentioned this a couple of times, it's another heresy, and that is that Herbert Armstrong did not restore all things. In the Bible, in two places, I read to you from Matthew, uh, I think it was 17:11 and uh, Mark 9:12, uh, that the Elijah to come was to restore all things. Herbert Armstrong, in the Mystery of the Ages, said that he had restored, quote, at least 18 basic and essential truths have been restored to the true church since the year 1933. Yes, I do agree that Herbert Armstrong restored those 18 truths, and at least 18. I completely agree with that. But he did not claim that he restored all things. And what I've noticed is that some of these people who claim that uh, you have to claim, say that Herbert Armstrong was Elijah or believe it, or you can't be a Philadelphia church leader, they don't have a Philadelphia era work. They do not put their high priority or their top priority on Proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, which Jesus said needed to be done in Matthew 24, 14. They're not leading the final phase of the work. They don't have their hearts in doing the work of God. Uh, they are at the best uh, lukewarm. Yet they hang, or they rationalize it in their mind, that because they believe that Herbert Armstrong is Elijah, that means they're right and they shouldn't support a leader who won't go out and say Herbert W. Armstrong was Elijah. Now, Herbert Armstrong also, by the way, said in the Mystery of the Ages that the Elijah would come at the very end of the church age. Now, when did Herbert Armstrong say the very end of the church age is going to be? He said when the church is done fulfilling Matthew 24, 14, and it goes to a place of safety. Now, some people will say, aha, Herbert Armstrong finished Matthew 24, 14, so that meant it was him. Well, Herbert Armstrong the last two or three letters that he wrote said the work needed to be done. He appointed people to do it. He set up the system for it to take place. And his position always was the work needed to be done until the time to flee to a place of safety or protection. I've got an article about the top priority of the church. That's over also at the uh, cogwriter.com website. If you want to read more direct quotes from Herbert Armstrong on that particular subject. And I've covered this in the past. But that, uh, that is a, a heresy in my, my opinion. And I believe Herbert Armstrong would consider that Elias Elijah heresies are heresies. Aaron Dean, who I've spoken to on multiple occasions on this subject, said that Herbert Armstrong admitted to him that there could be Elijah to come after him, especially if Herbert Armstrong died long before Jesus returned. And Herbert Armstrong died uh, over 27 years ago. Jesus has not returned. The church age is not over. All right, letter 29. Near-death experiences about these people who see lights and have supposedly have died. Oddly, people have actually gotten PhDs in this. I talked to a couple of people uh, who were actually studying this and consider this a very important subject. Uh, modern science doesn't 
go along with the idea. Uh, there was a recent study that just came out again that said what these people are experiencing is not death. Um, uh, some, something is going on in their brain. How do we know that they're not dead? Let's take your Bibles. Let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. You don't have to believe the science on this, and sometimes scientists are lie, so. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in a grave where you are going. So, they're, they're, they don't go there and come back with all this great knowledge. But that's what some of them seem to think, that they've gone out and they, they've had that. Let's skip, go back a few verses to verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward for their memory of them is forgotten. So when you die, you don't know anything until you're resurrected. And no, I do not believe that these people have near-death experiences are being resurrected. Uh, that it doesn't, it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit with the, the facts, it doesn't fit what, what seems to go on with them. All right, letter 30, ordination of women. Now I alluded to this before and I said I, perhaps I should have put these letters in a, in a order where they're more related to, other, to one another, but I thought I'd just take them in the order that they're in this book that I was given by the old uh, Worldwide Church of God. The, uh, the Continuing Church of God believes that it's proper to ordain women as deaconesses. Uh, as it says in Romans chapter 16, verse 1, the word servant in the original Greek is uh, deaconos, which can be deacon or deaconess. Uh, both deacons and deaconesses uh, serve the church. Uh, they tend to serve in non-preaching functions, although the men usually will give uh, sermonettes and sometimes uh, sermons. Now, the Bible shows that we're not supposed to ordain women as uh, uh, ministers. You can read about that in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34, and 1 Timothy uh, uh, 2, verse 12. But the Bible is clear that women have very important roles. Uh, we did a sermon on that that you can watch. It's at the uh, Continuing COG YouTube channel. You can also get to it from the ccog.org website, and you can also uh, uh, find it uh, in our, our letters to the brethren. And I believe I also have it linked at the uh, uh, cogwriter.com website. And if I don't, I'll do it before this comes out. I'll try to make sure I do that. So you can read more about the roles of women uh, in the New Testament church and uh, throughout history. And in the continuing church of God, uh, women fulfill a lot of roles. Uh, they assist with many things, including uh, the videoing of this, uh, of the sermons, they also assist with uh, uh, editing and uh, help, helping with the feasts and a lot of other uh, things that need to be done. Uh, letter 31 has to do with the Song of Solomon. It just says that Song of Solomon was written by Solomon and illustrates a right and wholesome attitude toward the intimacies of normal married life. Uh, there are other aspects of it. Uh, Henry Holly, in his pocket uh, Bible handbook, states, Its essence is to be found in its tender and devoted expression of intimacies and delights of wedded love. Some scholars believe this book has a dual purpose and spiritually also illustrates the intimate relationship Christ has with his church, his bride, and I would agree with that. Letter 32, completely different subject. The subject of confession. The Church of God believes Christians are to confess their sins to God, not uh, not men in uh, the general sense. Basically, and I'm going to read this from a, a Catholic translation, James 15, James 5, verse 16. Confess therefore your sins one to another, pray for one another, that you may be saved, for, for the continual prayer of a just man avails much. I use the Catholic translation because a lot of times, you know, Roman Catholics say you have to do this confession to, to the priests. It doesn't teach that even in their own translations. Uh, I'm going to read from another Catholic translation. This will be the New Jerusalem Bible. So confess your sins one to another and pray for one another 
to be cured. In a heartfelt prayer of someone, someone upright works very powerfully. Okay, the prayer of someone upright works very powerfully. Sorry for my emphasis here. There's one other time the Bible talks about confessing sins. You can go to uh, 1 John 7, excuse me, 1 John 1, 7 through 10. 1 John 1, 7 through 10. I'm going to read this also from the Dewey Rames. But if we walk in the light, as he also is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all iniquity. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. What that really says, basically, is Christians are supposed to confess our sins, and Jesus will forgive them. But there's no discussion of what Catholics call penance. And according to other scriptures, it's Jesus or God we're supposed to confess our sins too. For example, Romans 14, 11, For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Therefore, every one of us shall render account to God for himself. And now I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to read a couple different passages there, starting with Hebrews chapter 3. In verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly vocation, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus. Jesus is the one the Bible talks about for confession. Now I'll go over a couple of pages to Hebrews chapter 4. This time we're going to start reading in verse 14. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Having therefore a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we have not a high priest who cannot have compassion on our infirmities, but one tempted in all things like we are without sin. Verse 16. Let us go therefore with confidence to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and seasonable aid. So we're supposed to go to Christ, go to God, to ask for forgiveness of our sins. Go to the book of Acts, chapter 19. We'll notice something else also. Acts 19, starting verse 18. And many of them that believed came confessing and declaring their deeds. And many of them which had followed curious arts, that would be uh, like witchcraft and that kind of stuff, uh, astrology, brought together their books and burnt them before them all, and counting the price of them, they found the money being 50,000 pieces of silver. Back in those days, books were very, very expensive. And these people knew these books were wrong. So, they, so what do they do? Go to the local bookstore and sell them, right? No, they realized it was wrong for these books to exist. So they, they burnt them. Now, I'd like to make a couple of comments from the Catholic Encyclopedia as far as what the Catholics talk about penance, because sometimes people act like it was something from the beginning, this idea of penance. For those of you who are not raised in a Catholic background, what Roman Catholics do is they go to confession, it's frequently on a Saturday they'll go, they'll tell a priest their sins, the priest will tell them what they need to do to make up for it. Now you can't pay for your, you can't make up for your sins, but the priest tells you you can, and they call it penance. Normally what this involves is going out and kneeling uh, in, in a church and saying a bunch of prayers. Catholics usually, they like to do something, they pray called the Rosary, where they say so many Hail Marys and Our Fathers and that kind of stuff. And if you mumble these words well enough, that's penance. Sometimes they have you do other types of penance. And here, here's something the Catholic Encyclopedia says. Penance is a sacrament of the new law instituted by Christ, which I didn't see that in the Bible, in which forgiveness of sins committed after baptism is granted through the priest's absolution of those who with sorrow confess their sins and promise to satisfy for the same. The Council of Trent declares Christ principally instituted the sacrament of penance after his resurrected, resurrection, a miracle greater than that of healing the sick. Clement, in his epistle to the Corinthians, not only exhorts to repentance, but begs that the seditious submit themselves to the presbyters and receive correction so as to repent. 
And Ignatius of Antioch, at the close of the first century, speaks of the mercy of God to sinners, providing they return with one consent to the unity and the communion of the bishop. The cause communion of the bishop evidently means a bishop with his council of presbyters as his assessors. He, that's Ignatius, Ignatius also says in his letters to the Philadelphians that the bishop presides over uh, penance. Well, that's not really true. First of all, there's no discussion in the Bible in the New Testament that Jesus ever instituted penance for the forgiveness of sins committed after baptism. It's true that Jesus taught forgiveness of sins, but this bold assertion about Jesus teaching penance is false. Now, the Catholic Encyclopedia claims that the letter to the Corinthians, which they call First Clement, is, a, is teaching its version of conversion, confession and penance. But that's not what it teaches. I'd like to actually read you from the letter that's supposed to the proof. It says, Let us look steadfastly to the blood of Christ and see how precious that blood is to God which has been shed for our salvation has set the grace of repentance before the whole world. Let us turn to every age that has passed and learn that from generation to generation the Lord has granted a place of repentance to all as would be converted to him. So Clement's letter, so-called, is actually about repentance. Nor preach repentance, and as many as listen to him were saved. The Lord, brethren, stands in need of nothing, and he desires nothing of anyone except confession be made to him. So this letter, supposedly from Clement, said Jesus requires nothing except you confess. It doesn't say that you have to do penance. You, therefore, who laid the foundation of this sedition, submit yourselves to the presbyters or elders, and receive correction so as you repent, bending the knees in your heart. What he's saying is, if you're doing something wrong, and an elder or, or a presbyter, in the Greek, tells you that you're wrong, that you should repent. That's what, this, what he was talking about. But what about Ignatius? Did he teach penance the way the, the Catholic Church teaches? No. Here's what he taught in his letter to the Philippians. Ignatius, to the Church of God, by the way, he wrote the letter to the Church of God, the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, which is at Philadelphia in Asia, Asia Minor, which has obtained mercy, is established in the harmony of God, and rejoices unceasingly in the passion of our Lord, is filled with all mercy. See, we're, again, we're reading about mercy here, through his resurrection, which I salute in the blood of Jesus Christ, who is eternal and enduring joy, especially those who are in unity with the bishop, the presbyters, and deacons, who have been appointed according to the mind of Jesus Christ, whom he has established in security after his own will by his Holy Spirit. For as many as are of God and of Jesus Christ are also with the bishop or the church leadership, and as many shall in the exercise of repentance return to the unity of the church, these two shall belong to God that they may live according to Jesus Christ. So what Ignatius was saying is, if people have left the church, they should repent. And if they repent, they come back to the church. And the, the bishop, pastor, elder will say, okay, that's fine. But you're talking about people who have left the church. We're not talking about people who've, who, who are going to church all the time and trying to live a life, a, a righteous life, going and telling the elders or the priests, presbyters, the, word, uh, the Catholics claim they get the word priest from, uh, every private sin that they've done, that's not the type of authority that, that the Bible is given to, to people. Yet, in Canon 6 of the Can Can Council of Trent, listen to this, if anyone denies either the sacramental confession was instituted or is necessary to salvation, they're saying their, their sacramental confession is necessary for salvation. If you deny that, or the matter of confessing secretly to a priest alone, that the, which the church has ever observed from the beginning, if you do this, if you say it's a human invention, let it be anathema. So the Council of Trent is ignoring the fact that the Bible did not implement secret profession, confession to a priest. And if you don't do that, it says let you be anathema, cut off, and you're cursed if you teach that the Bible doesn't teach that you're supposed to private, secretly confess all your private sins to a priest. It's not in the Bible. Interestingly, even though the Council of Trent said that, so I want to read something from the Catholic uh, Catechism. 
which came out in 1993, says, over the centuries, the concrete form in which the church exercised this has varied considerably. Oh, you mean it wasn't always the same, one for all. During the 7th century, missionaries inspired by the Eastern uh, monastic tradition took to continental Europe the private practice of penance, which does not require public and prolonged completion of penitential works before the reconciliation with the church. This new practice envisioned the possibility of repetition and so opened the way to a regular frequenting of this sacrament. Okay, this is from uh, the version I have from 2003 that I was quoting from here. So in other words, the Council of Trent from the 1500s, which says, if you say this was changed or not the original practice, you're going to be cut off from God or, the, or their church. Their church is admitting, violating that same council, saying, we know we didn't have it from the beginning. We know we didn't tell people to go privately before a priest. And you can read that in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. If you want to get a copy, you can find it online. And it's uh, teaching number 1447. 1447. You can go and look it up and read and find out that that, again, disagrees with canon number 6 of the Council of Trent. All right. The other one scripture that people point to is John 20, 23. Does that not prove that confession, that, like the Church of Rome does, is correct? Well, I'm going to start in verse 21, John chapter 20. And I'm going to read from two Catholic translations. He said, therefore, to them again, Peace be to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive you the Holy Ghost. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. So that's from Catholic uh, Dewey Rames. Here's one from the Catholic New Jerusalem Bible. Verse 21. And he said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive, any, forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. Well, what's the problem with this? Well, for one, no early leader in the Church of God or the Greco-Roman Catholic Eastern Orthodox Church believed that this meant Christians were supposed to confess each of their sins uh, privately to a priest who would prescribe penance. So that's the first problem. This is clearly demonstrated from church history, and as I mentioned, number 1447 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church admits that this was not the case. And those people back in the first and second centuries would have understood what the Greek meant and what uh, a lot of what Jesus was trying to say here. Now I'd like to read this uh, from uh, letter 32. Some try to use John 2023 to prove that persons in ecclesiastical offices have the power to forgive sins. This verse reads, this is going to be from New King James, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. However, it doesn't mean that mere men can actually forgive sins in a spiritual sense. God alone can forgive sins. You can look in Mark 2, 7 through 10, and Luke 5, 21 through 24. Christ spoke these words to his future apostles in the context of church authority. He was giving them the power to disfellowship those who were dissenters or heretics. You can also look at that in 1 Corinthians 5, 2, or 1 Timothy 1, verse 20, and bring them back to the congregation upon repentance. You can look at 2 Corinthians, 6, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 2, 6 through 10. And by the way, in case I'm going through this relatively quickly, at the Cogwriter website, there's an article called History of Auricular Confession, and the sacrament of confession. All right, so if you want to read more about that or if I've gone over something a little quicker that you want to go through, uh, you can get the details there. Now, why is the Church of God position correct? Well, besides the scriptures being cited and the fact that the church has the biblical right to, quote, mark dissenters, as it says in uh, Romans 16, verse 17, the reality is that's how the early Christians seem to understand the Church of God's authority. And the authority they claimed was that regarding dissenters. 
For example, in that letter to the Corinthians that they call First Clement, it says, You, therefore, who laid the foundation of this sedition, submit yourselves to the presbyters and receive correction so as to repent, bending the knees of your hearts. So in other words, this idea that the Catholics are saying this has to do with their idea of private confession is not the case. There was a problem in Corinth. The Corinthians wrote, I believe they sent a letter actually to the Apostle John, who was in uh, Apostle Rome at the time, to ask for a decision. How do we handle the dissent that we have here? And basically they were told, look, the dissenters should repent, and the dissenters should come back. And once the dissenters uh, repent and they come back, then uh, the, the elders, the presbyters or the, in the area can say it's okay. And that was basically the advice. Also, that's what Ignatius said. In uh, his letter to the Philippians, uh, he said, for verse or chapter 3, For as many as are of God and Jesus Christ are also with the bishop, and as many in the exercise of repentance return to the unity of the church. These two shall belong to God. So again, the, the Church of Rome points to this as proof that their version of confession is what uh, was being talked about, but it's not. It's basically saying that the church has the authority to decide if someone has been a dissenter, someone's been difficult, someone's been marked or disfellowship, if they have the right to come back after they repent. There's nothing in the Bible that says you're supposed to go behind, behind closed doors in, this, in a dark area and mutter your words to a priest, and then that you can go ahead and do penance. You can't make up for your sins. You can repent, you can try to change, you can ask God to forgive you. But the uh, Roman Catholic idea that if you sin, as long as you go and tell the priest to sin and you mutter a bunch of uh, repetitive prayers or something to that effect, that that forgives your sins, that's not the case. You have to go before God. You say, well, that's really hard. How do I know God will forgive me? The Bible says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us or forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So you need to be serious about repentance. That's what God wants. The Bible says God didn't want sacrifice. God wants to have a pure heart. God wants you to repent. In Acts uh, 2, verse 38, it says, You must repent, Peter answered, and every one of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to go to uh, 1 John 1, verse 9. For if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth has no place in us. If we acknowledge our sin, he is trustworthy and upright, so he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all evil. And real repentance is not just saying you're sorry. It's not the equivalent of penance that's practiced by the Greco-Roman church. Well, what is it? Well, there's different words uh, rendered repent in the Bible. The Hebrew term generally used in the Old Testament is the word shub, which means to turn. This word goes beyond the idea of contrition and sorrow, but to a conscientious decision of turning back to God. In the New Testament, the Greek, there are two words that describe repentance. One is Episcopho, which means to convert, to change, to turn to, or to turn against. To turn against what you've done wrong and turn toward God, to change, you, you change your ways. The other is the word metanoia, which literally means to change of mind. Real repentance is not simply a feeling or an emotion, nor a mere act of contrition or atonement. It's basically an about face in life. Real repentance involves a mindset that you'll turn to God and you'll do what God says. I've referred to this before, the first John 1 9. I'm going to read from the Old King, excuse me, from the Dewey Rings Bible. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All sins that are repented of can be forgiven. Uh, at some point in time, um, I maybe I'll do a sermon or a sermonette on the unpardonable sin, but basically that would be blasphemy against the Holy Spirit where you don't care that you've turned from God, you don't care that you're sinning, you don't care that you're doing wrong, and you haven't repented. There are a lot of other letters 
And I think I'll stop at letter 32 this particular time. Uh, but before I do, I want to uh, summarize the main points about confession, since I spent a fair amount of time talking about it. The Bible does say to confess uh, sins to one another, but mainly Jesus Christ. Now, why would the Bible say to confess sins to one another? Because sometimes you could ask somebody to pray for you, to help you with a problem that you have. Maybe they've had the same kind of problem that you've had. Maybe they have had a problem with, let's say, excessive alcohol or something. Maybe you've had that. Maybe you could help them. And maybe if you even haven't had their problem, maybe you could be a friend, maybe you could listen, maybe you could help them. But the Bible doesn't say to confess privately to a priest, and never does it authorize penance for sin. The earliest writings show that penance, does not show that penance was implemented as a requirement. They showed that the Church of God believed it had the authority to determine whether or not someone could become part of the fellowship, and if they did something wrong, if they were would have them come back. It was uh, probably the Bishop Callistus that came up with this idea of repentance and penance, I mean, switched from repentance to penance, but that's a whole other matter. The Council of Trent, when they said that they've always had this from the beginning, that was wrong. The, the Catechism Catholic Church admits that there were changes. It was not an original practice, and it's not a practice of the Church of God. We in the Church of God should contend earnestly for the faith once it was for all delivered to the saints, which did not include the Catholic practice of confession, the way it's commonly done. We are to confess, we are to repent. I, I hope I've answered some questions this time. I hope to answer more questions in uh, future sermons. So until then, this is uh, Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God.